everyone, and welcome to another episode of Cabinet of Curiosities on Our Own Devices. I'm Jean Messi, and I'm here at 17 Wing in Winnipeg having a look at a set of sextants. And buckle in, because we're going to be taking a deep dive into the history and the technology of celestial navigation. Now, before I get started, I do want to issue a number of corrections to some of my previous videos. In my video 17 wing grab bag when discussing the astro compass, I stated that gyro compasses are thrown off at northern latitudes because the ground moves beneath you faster than at the equator. Uh, this of course is not true. The ground in terms of linear speed does move faster at the equator. What I meant to say was that because lines of longitude converge at the poles, uh, they're more closely spaced and they pass beneath you faster in northern latitudes. Hence, your gyro compass will experience a great amount of drift and navigational error. Uh, I also stated that the astro compass was used in the astrodome of aircraft. It could be, and it was on certain occasions, but more often than not, it was mounted in the navigator's window or even in the cockpit. So again, sorry for those oversights. Another correction is to my video on the SM-65 Atlas series of rockets in which I called the Ranger probes lunar orbiters. As one of you pointed out, the Ranger probes did not orbit the moon. In fact, they were just simple impactors that were fired straight at the moon and took pictures of the surface as they approached until they finally impacted the surface. So a little bit of a minor oversight there. I figured that it wasn't major enough to warrant taking the video down and re-uploading it. So again, thanks for pointing that out. I do strive for the maximum amount of accuracy in these videos, and a big part of maintaining that is comments from viewers like you. Anyway, on with the show. So the sextant is a celestial navigation instrument which first appeared in the mid-18th century. And it was really the culmination of a long line of similar instruments dating back all the way to the 13th century. And while the mechanics of these varied quite widely, uh, they all served the same basic function. They were all a form of inclinometer used to determine the altitude of a celestial body. And when I say altitude here, I'm not referring to you know, linear distance above the ground. I'm referring to the angular altitude, the angle between a fixed reference point, such as the horizon, and a celestial body. And that is the definition we're going to be using from here on in. Now, one of the first such instruments was the Mariner's Astrolabe, which dates back to around 1295. And this is not to be confused with the much more complicated Astronomer's Astrolabe, which dates back to antiquity, and which is worth a video on its own. Now, the Mariner's Astrolabe was a basic form of what's known as an alidade, which is a circular scale with a rotating pointer on it. And how you would use it is you would suspend it on a little loop at the top, and you would look along the pointer and adjust it to match up with whatever celestial body you were measuring in order to determine its altitude. Uh, if you were looking at a star or the moon, you would do it this way. If you were looking at the sun, you wouldn't use it directly. You would instead suspend it and adjust it so that a beam of sunlight would pass through two holes in the veins. You wouldn't actually be directly looking at the sun. So by the early 16th century, the Mariner's Astrolabe had largely been supplanted by something called the Cross Staff or Jacob Staff. And this was a graduated rod with a sliding cross piece. And you would aim this at the celestial body and adjust the cross piece until it showed up on the edge of the piece. And then you were able through trigonometry to determine the angle to the celestial body. This worked just fine, but there was a problem. If you were taking a sunshot, it required you to stare directly into the sun, which is not only really bad for your eyes, but also makes it very difficult to discern the disk of the sun and thus make an accurate measurement either off the center of the disk or more often than not, one of its two limbs, the upper or lower tangent. And so in 1594, the instrument maker John Davis came up with something called the Davis Quadrant or the Backstaff. And you actually use this not facing towards the sun, but facing away from it. And you would use not a direct sight of the sun, but rather a shadow cast on a little pointer that would fall on a scale. And then you could adjust and line this up in order to determine the angle and the altitude. So all these instruments worked well enough for their era, but all suffered from the same basic flaw, which was that they assumed that you were standing on a flat surface and that you had a fixed line of sight to the horizon. But of course, this is rarely the case on the pitching deck of a ship, meaning that it was very difficult to get an accurate altitude reading in anything but the calmest weather. So in order to correct this, in 1699, Sir Isaac Newton came up with an instrument he called the reflecting octant. 
And this was later improved upon by the instrument makers John Hadley and Thomas Godfrey. And there were a couple of differences, but for all intents and purposes, the octant was identical to the later sextant, and so I'm going to use this sextant to show you how it works. So let's come in a little bit closer. So the octant and the sextant are doubly reflecting instruments, meaning that they have two mirrors. The first one at the front here is known as the horizon mirror, and as you can see, it's half silvered. So one half is clear, allowing you to see through to the horizon, while the other half is mirrored. And this reflects the light from the celestial object that you're measuring, which is bounced off of the secondary mirror, which is known as the index mirror. And this is connected to a pivoting arm that rotates around this scale, and this is what gives you your angle and altitude reading. Now, most sextants will have a secondary vernier scale, or a little vernier drum, for added accuracy. And as you can see, this one has a little magnifying lens, which allows you to better read the scale. Now, some other details here. Uh, there's a number of sunshades that you can put in front of the horizon and the index mirror. And this is not only to protect your eyes, but also to allow you to cut out the glare and better discern the disk of the sun. So you can take a measurement off of its lower limb, its tangent surface. Then finally, you have the telescope, which allows you to look through both mirrors at the same time. So another interesting detail about this particular sextant is that it actually comes with three different telescopes. So one of these is a regular magnifying telescope. I'm not quite sure what the magnification is, but it looks like something like three times. One of them is non-magnifying, but it still gives you a clear and narrow field of vision that allows you to make accurate measurements. But the third is the interesting one because it's a regular magnifying telescope, but the image that it gives you is inverted and that is for use at night. So the extra lenses needed to flip the image back right side up actually absorb a significant amount of light, which can make fainter objects like stars difficult to see. So this telescope is actually a compromise between getting adequate magnification and getting adequate amounts of light through. So since the process of lining up a celestial object with the horizon is easy enough, even when the image is inverted, this doesn't provide too much of a challenge to navigation. So how you would actually use one of these is you would look through the telescope, through the non-silvered part of your horizon mirror to find the horizon, and then you would find your chosen astronomical object using index mirror and sweep the arm until the lower limb of that object, its lower tangent surface, just contacts the horizon. And then you can read your altitude off the scale. And the advantage of the octant and the sextant over earlier instruments was that both your reference, your horizon, and your astronomical object moved together in your line of sight. They, moved rel they didn't move relative to one another, which meant that you could take a very accurate reading even on the pitching deck of a ship. Now, at the same time, you need to take note of the precise time at which you take your measurements. And the reason for this is that at the rate at which the Earth rotates, 15 degrees per hour, at the equator, a timing error of one second translates into a navigational error of around a quarter of a nautical mile. So these errors can add up very quickly if you're not careful. So navigators try to take their star or sun or moon shots at the same time of day or night. So for example, uh, if you're taking a sun shot, the typical time to take that is at local noon, the moment at which the sun appears at its highest point in the sky. But local noon varies depending on longitude, your distance east or west of the prime meridian. So how do you know when that is? Well, you can actually determine local noon using your sextant, provided you have an accurate enough chronometer. And what you would do is around the time of local noon, you can estimate it, you take a series of sunshots as the sun is going through its arc to its zenith. And you can plot that arc, and based on the timing of each of your observations, you can interpolate and find the precise moment of local noon, and then you take your altitude at that time, and then you can use that to fix your position. So the basic principle of celestial navigation is that at any given point in time during the year, the same celestial object will appear in the same place in the sky. But its relative position will change depending on your position on the Earth's surface. And so if you know where that object ought to be at a particular day and time, and you measure its position from your location, you can then take the difference between those two measurements and determine your actual position on the Earth's surface. And in order to determine where that celestial object ought to be at a given day and time, 
you consult a book called a nautical almanac, or in this case, an air almanac. This is an example produced for the RAF and the RCAF during World War II, but it's basically the same book. But before I can show you how this works, how you use an air almanac to determine your position, first need to go over some celestial navigation terminology. Time to pull out a visual aid. So fortuitously, the heritage collection here at 17 Wing happened to include this celestial sphere model that came out of a navigation school. And this is just the perfect visual aid with which to show you some of the terminology and concepts involved in celestial navigation. So the concept of celestial navigation is based on the concept of the celestial sphere, which is an imaginary transparent sphere that sits out some distance from the Earth, and on whose surface the stars, the planets, the sun, and the moon all travel. And the coordinate system used for pinpointing the location of a celestial object is the same as on the Earth's surface. It's a series of lines of latitude and longitude, only projected out onto the surface of the celestial sphere. However, for historical reasons, uh, we don't use latitude and longitude to describe the position of a celestial object. We use other terms. So for example, the longitude of a celestial object, its position east-west, is given as Greenwich hour angle, or GHA. And as the name implies, this is measured off the Greenwich celestial meridian, which is a projection of the prime meridian on the Earth's surface, which of course runs through Greenwich, England. Similarly, latitude is given as declination. But again, this is the exact same thing as latitude being measured north or south of the celestial equator. Now, GHA and the declination are given for the sun, the moon, and the planets because these tend to move relative to one another quite a bit. For the stars, however, it's a little bit different because the stars don't actually move all that much relative to one another, at least not to a degree that's of any importance to a navigator. And this is why they're commonly known as the fixed stars. They're essentially fixed to the celestial sphere. And so the position of stars is given as the sidereal hour angle, or SHA. And this is an angular offset measured from something called the first point of Aries. So the first point of Aries is one of two locations of the equinoxes, in this case the vernal equinox. And this is one of two positions where the celestial equator crosses the path of the ecliptic, which is the orbit or of the Earth around the Sun. The Earth, of course, being tilted at an angle relative to its orbit. Uh, the other such point is called the first point of Libra, and that's the point of the autumnal equinox. And so to get the local hour angle of a star, essentially it's GHA, you simply add the location of the first point of Aries to the sidereal hour angle. So this system just makes it easier to note down the position of the stars in a nautical almanac, which we'll look at in a second, because their angular offset, their sidereal hour angle relative to the first point of Aries, doesn't change. So all you need to do is note the position of the first point of Aries, and then the offset to each star will be identical. Now, one last piece of terminology that we need to look at is something called the substellar point. And this is simply if you take the position of a celestial object, like a star right here, and project it down towards the center of the Earth, the point at which it intersects the Earth's surface is the substellar point. And so when you're determining your position on the Earth's surface, you're trying to determine it relative to the substellar point of whatever object you chose to measure. So a new nautical almanac is issued for every year, and each page covers a different day of that year. So as you can see, for each day the positions are given for the Sun, planets Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars, and 50 common navigational stars. For the Sun and planets, these positions are given in terms of Greenwich hour angle and declination in 10 minute increments. While for the stars, only the sidereal hour angle, or the offset from the first point of Aries, is given. And in this case, these values don't change substantially between January and April, which is the period covered by this particular almanac. To find the local hour angle, or LHA, of any given star, you just add its SHA to the GHA of the first point of Aries, which is given in this table. 
If your measurement happens to fall somewhere between these 10 minute increments, the almanac also includes interpolation tables for the Sun and the first point of Aries here and planets in the back. There are also tables for correcting for various errors inherent to the measurement process. For example, dip is the error introduced by the fact that the measurement is being taken from a certain height above the horizon. And standard dome refraction is the error induced by sighting through the aircraft's transparent plastic astrodome. There's also an atmospheric refraction error that's more prominent closer to the horizon where the atmosphere is thicker, and an index error particular to each sextant which the navigator would enter in this space here. To determine your position using a sextant and almanac, you would first need an assumed position, that is, where you think you are. Uh, this is typically estimated via dead reckoning, that is, using your course and speed to determine how far you traveled over a particular time interval. You then make your altitude measurements using your sextant. When sighting the sun, you can determine your latitude from the altitude and your longitude from the difference between local noon and noon at a fixed reference location like Greenwich. If you can measure multiple objects like stars or planets, then you can triangulate your position on a chart. For greatest accuracy, you would need to measure three or more objects, noting the precise time of each measurement in Greenwich Mean Time. Then you use your almanac to find the actual GHA or SHA and declination of the objects at the time of the measurements. These values are used to determine the actual altitude and the azimuth of the objects, azimuth being the compass bearing from north. This is either done using formulas, or as portable calculators were not widely available when the almanac was first published in 1767, using a set of pre-calculated navigation tables. The true altitudes of the celestial objects are then subtracted from the measured altitudes to give the difference in latitude from the assumed position. And since one nautical mile is defined as one minute of arc on the Earth's surface, each second of difference equals one mile north or south. The position fix can then either be made directly on a chart or mathematically using trigonometry. On a chart, the azimuth or bearing of each object is drawn along with the offset between the true and measured altitude. If three or more objects are measured, the lines converge to form a triangle known to navigators as a cocked hat. The more accurate the initial measurement, the smaller the cocked hat and the more accurate the position fix. For this to work properly, however, all measurements need to be corrected so that they all take place at the same time. This again is done using dead reckoning, using the speed and course of the vehicle. So as the name suggests, the octant had a scale with an arc of one eighth of a circle, or 45 degrees. And because it and the sextant are doubly reflecting instruments, they're actually able to measure twice the angle of the scale. So the octant was able to measure angles of up to 90 degrees. And this is perfectly adequate for the type of navigation the octant was being used for, since it was being used to determine the altitude of objects above the horizon, 90 degrees was all you needed. However, starting in 1759, the octant started being replaced by the sextant, which has an arc of 60 degrees and thus can measure angles of up to 120 degrees. And the reason for this had to do with the problem of longitude. So while determining your latitude based on the altitude of celestial objects is relatively straightforward and has been practiced for centuries, the problem of longitude determining your position east-west remained basically unsolved until the mid-18th century. And the reason for this is that the basic method for determining longitude is based on time. So the further east you go, the earlier local noon occurs, and vice versa. The farther west you go, the later it occurs. And so if you can determine local noon at your particular position, and you know what the time is at your home port, say Greenwich in England, the difference between those two times gives you your distance east or west. Problem is, up until the late 18th century, there were no clocks that could keep accurate time aboard a ship. They were all based on pendulums, and thus would be thrown off by the movement of the ship. So astronomers started looking around for different astronomical methods to determine longitude. So one of the first such methods was proposed by Galileo Galilei in 1612, and it involved observing the moons of Jupiter. What Galileo realized was that the movement of these moons could be used as a sort of universal clock that could be observed from any point on the Earth's surface. And by observing Jupiter, you could determine the local time, say, in Greenwich, 
and then compare this to your local time in order to determine your longitude. Problem was, the moons of Jupiter are very faint and difficult to observe, especially on the pitching deck of a ship. So in order to try and solve this, Galileo came up with a rather silly looking device called a celatone, which was a helmet with a telescope attached to it, so you could keep your head still and observe Jupiter even as the ship rocked and pitched beneath you. But even with this, it was a very difficult method, it wasn't very practical, and it was never widely adopted. However, in 1514, the German navigator Johann Werner came up with the method of lunar distances, which involved measuring the angle between the moon and various other celestial objects. But this required that you measure angles over 90 degrees, which was why the sextant was introduced, because it could measure up to 120 degrees. Now the method of lunar distances wasn't perfect, but it was all anybody really had for around 200 years. Then, in 1714, the British Admiralty put out a prize for anybody who could come up with a more reliable method of determining longitude. And the prize was £10,000 for an accuracy of one degree, and £20,000 for an accuracy of half a degree. And the story of how that prize was eventually won and how the problem of longitude was cracked is fascinating in its own right. And it involves a clockmaker named John Harrison who produced a series of increasingly sophisticated and accurate marine chronometers. And a copy of the last one, H4, was carried by James Cook on his latter two voyages. And this helped establish this as the standard method of determining longitude until the advent of electronic navigation aids like GPS. But that's a story for another time, and I'll probably make a whole other video about it. So the basic design of the classic marine sextant is based on the assumption that you're able to see both the horizon and the celestial object you're measuring at the same time. And this is a reasonable assumption, since out at sea it's rare to have haze on the horizon without some sort of overcast. So if you can see one, you'll likely be able to see the other. Up in the air though, it's a different situation, since if you're flying above the clouds, you might not be able to see the horizon. So for navigating in the air, you need something called a bubble sextant. And this was invented in the 1920s by Carlos Coutinho, who was a Portuguese aviator who was the first to cross the South Atlantic by air from Lisbon to Rio de Janeiro in 1922. And the bubble sextant takes its name from the bubble level or spirit level that acts as an artificial horizon. So rather than actually sighting the real horizon, you keep this bubble level and use that as your reference. And here I have a pair of World War II bubble sextants. These are the Hughes Mark 9 and Mark 9A used by the RAF and the RCAF. And before you ask, no, not Howard Hughes, a different Hughes company. Now let's go in and have a little bit of a closer look at how this works. So here is our Mark 9 bubble sextant, and many of these would have had a little bracket so you could hook it up onto the astrodome of an aircraft. This one appears to be missing. On the left hand side here we can see a handle which doubles as a battery compartment, and that supplies power to a little light bulb that illuminates the bubble at night. During the day, that illumination would be provided through this little aperture right here. So also on this side, you can see a little lever right here to operate the light. Uh, this is a knob for controlling the bubble, so when using this you would bring the bubble into view, level it as best you could, release this, and the bubble would disappear, and then you could make your sight as in a normal sextant. Also as in a normal sextant, there is a shade selector knob right here. So this allows you to select various degrees of shade in front of your eyepiece when sighting the sun. And then you have a little aperture right here that tells you how much shade you've selected. In the back here, we have our eyepiece. And then in the front, we have our mirrors. Now flipping over to the other side, here we have our course and find adjustment knobs and a knob which adds 10 degrees to your measurement. Uh, we also have another handle. And inside here is actually a little light bulb with a prism which is meant to illuminate your wristwatch. And the instructions for these tell you to wear your wristwatch upside down so that you can read it at night while taking your shots just by glancing over from your eyepiece. And finally, we have a little tablet right here for writing down your measurements. And interestingly enough, that's made from a material called ivorine, which is made by treating casein, which is a protein from milk, with formaldehyde. 
And that was actually a very popular, very cheap plastic used for things like buttons uh, up until the 1950s. So the bubble theoretically gives you a stable horizon line off of which to base your measurements. But in an aircraft, you're likely to encounter a lot of turbulence and acceleration vectors that are likely to throw off the bubble and hence your measurements. And one of the ways to get around this is to take multiple measurements and then take an average. Now you could do this by hand, but with the Mark 9 sextant, you actually don't have to because there is a clever little mechanism built in that takes the average for you. And how this works, is every time you take a shot, you then press this lever, and this decouples a clutch between the mirror and the averaging mechanism. You then wind back your knob, take another sight, release the clutch, wind back your knob, take another sight, and you do this a total of six times. And on the sixth shot, the sextant snaps a shutter in front of the eyepiece to prevent you from taking another shot. And the reason for this has to do with the exact mechanism by which the averaging is done. And this is super cool. And ordinarily, when you take an average, you add up all your measurements and then divide by the number of measurements, in this case, six. The mechanism in here, which is basically just an odometer, does the reverse. Every time you take a shot, the averaging mechanism only measures one sixth of the value of the angle. That way, when it adds up all six shots, it ends up being the average. So rather than adding up and dividing, it divides, then adds up, and finally displays your average. So pretty cool. But this still isn't perfect. As with a regular sextant, you still have to take careful note of the precise timing of each of your shots. So it's a process that could benefit from a little more automation. And indeed, that's exactly what happened when they introduced the Mark 9A. And you'll notice that this looks almost identical to the regular Mark 9, only it has this big cylindrical contraption hanging out the front. And this is a clockwork mechanical averager. And this performs the exact same function as the manual averager in the Mark 9, only it's completely automated. So how this works is you wind it up just like a clock. And when you're ready to start taking your shots, you press this trigger and the mechanism starts rotating. And what it does is it takes 60 equally timed measurements over a period of two minutes. And just like with the Mark 9, at the end of that, it snaps a shutter over the eyepiece. And so all you need to do is take note of the time when you started your run of shots and then when it ended, and you know that all of your shots are equally spaced over that two minutes. And it makes navigation a little bit easier. Later versions would make use of something called a ball and disc integrator, which I'll probably cover in another video, but it performs basically the same function, only smoothly and continuously instead of intermittently like this. So one last thing to note about these is that although they're commonly known as bubble sextants, they're actually technically octants, only able to measure angles of up to 90 degrees. This isn't a problem though, because since you're measuring from a reference line that's above the horizon, uh, the angles that you're going to be measuring are all going to be under 90 degrees. But by the time these were designed in the 1920s, the sextant had long ago supplanted the octant, so the common name for this type of reflecting instrument was sextant, and that's what they called these. So just for the sake of completeness, I've decided to pull out two more sextants. A really big one, and an itty bitty one. So this is a periscopic sextant, and this was designed to be mounted in the fuselage of an aircraft, with the periscopic head sticking out into the airstream. And this was intended to eliminate the need for a big astrodome, which was very important with the advent of pressurized aircraft, as it meant you only had to cut a relatively small hole in the fuselage. But other than the periscopic head, this is nearly identical to the other bubble sextants that I've shown you. It has the same bubble mechanism, it has the same mirror mechanism, it has the same mechanical averager at the front here. About the only difference, other than the periscope head, is that this runs off the aircraft's electrical system through this jack at the front here, rather than having its own battery pack. So the last section I have to show you is this super cute little thing right here. And this would have been issued to artillery crews, to military engineers, to members of the Signal Corps during World War I. And this is actually part of a larger set of engineer's equipment, including a clinometer and two compasses, which I received as a gift a long time ago when I was a very young child. And the leather cases for these are actually stamped with the names of the people who own them, who were part of the Canadian Signal Corps. 
And so I'm currently doing the research to try and find out more about these people and I'll likely do a full feature video on that set of equipment. But until then, just because I thought this fit with the theme of sextants, we can have a look at this little thing, which I think is just so neat and it's such a cute little thing, but it is undeniably a sextant. It has a horizon mirror, it has an index mirror, it has your fine and coarse adjustment knobs and a little arm swinging across a scale and then even a little magnifying glass to allow you to read the scale. And it folds up into a convenient little carrying case which has your navigation tables printed on the inside. And this would have been used for things like laying out trench networks or getting solutions for uh, artillery or just all these different measuring tasks that you would have in the trenches of the First World War. So just really cool. So there you have it, a brief history of celestial navigation and some of the basic instruments used by both nautical and aerial navigators. Now I don't pretend to be an expert on celestial navigation. I had to give myself something of a crash course uh, in the subject in order to make this video, but I still hope that it was an interesting introduction to at least the basics and the technological aspects of the subject. Now if you want to learn more, you can, there's plenty of YouTube videos out there giving step-by-step -step guides as to how to navigate using a sextant and a nautical almanac. So please check those out. I'll link a couple of them in the description. Now that's all I have for you today. A uh, big shout out to the staff here at 17 Wing for allowing me to poke through their collection and bring fascinating artifacts to you on this channel. Uh, tune in next time for another episode of Cabinet of Curiosities where we'll look at more fascinating artifacts just like this one. Until then, I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.